Good afternoon, everybody. This is the Greek Scientist Society again, meeting you coming back here for our weekly webinars. Uh, we have had a short break, but now we are back. Uh, we're very happy to be uh, here tonight with Professor Emanuela Dermizakis. Uh, we're going to have what we know will be a very intriguing uh, discussion, given the subject of uh, Professor Dermizakis, who will be discussing principles of biomedical research and the problems of precision medicine, the potential of precision medicine uh, in uh, current clinical practice. But uh, before uh, inviting him to come uh, to the States, I would like to invite um, uh, the spirit soul of this uh, society, Teo Zakaris, to come to States. Hello, Teo. How are you? Long time no see. Hello, 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 hello everybody. Uh, Professor Jakis, uh, very pleased and honored to have you with us. Uh, you opened the second series after uh, we had our symposium. Thank you so much uh, for delivering your uh, webinar uh, with us. Uh, very short notice. Uh, you may be aware uh, if you follow our uh, group on uh, LinkedIn, uh, we have uh, soft launched this uh, month uh, the, the, our platform. Uh, let me uh, uh, present you short video, one minute uh, with, the, uh, with uh, some uh, Details about this platform, uh, we are very honored and happy. The platform will go live on uh, May 1st. One minute video and I give the back to Professor Dernitschakis. Thanks again. You are welcome to join uh, the test uh, platform if you are familiar, especially with IT uh, issues and things like that. We still customize it. Bye. Thank you, Theo. Thank you, everyone. I would like to remind our uh, listeners that we are streaming live in uh, Facebook and YouTube. Chris Akokotidou is co-hosting with me this session and she will be collecting your uh, your questions so that Professor Dermizakis uh, will be able to comment on them. Uh, for the very few of you that might not know who Emmanuel Dermizakis is, I would like to make a short introduction. Uh, he's honoring us uh, tonight as a director of the Health 2030 Genome Center and a professor of genetics in the Department of Genetic Medicine and Development of the University of Geneva Medical School, a very active researcher, uh, a researcher in the fields of uh, biomedical uh, science and uh, precision medicine. I would like to thank you for being with us uh, tonight and I would like to invite you to the stage and please you now share your screen. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to share some of the ideas. Um, uh, what I realized was I uh, was a bit ambitious by putting biomedical research uh, as a sort of a, an initial topic. Uh, I think we would pr probably be needing uh, about five hours to, to, to develop this topic. So I decided to narrow it a bit um, and talk about genomics and the promise of precision medicine. Um, it's the same kind of direction, but more uh, focused uh, around my field and the field that I feel very comfortable with. And uh, what I'm going to try to do today, um, the next 40 minutes or so, is try to give you some basic principles of, uh, of how we see genomics, not from the point of view of an expert, but from the point of view of, of uh, the community of biomedical research science. Uh, and how this is actually bringing new information, new uh, opportunities, so that we go into what we call precision medicine, which is basically the realization of uh, 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 more precise and, 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 and more comprehensive information uh, for decision making in, the, in clinics as well as in prevention. 
I'd like to start with this slide. Um, and this slide basically demonstrates uh, a wish. Um, of course, <laughs> normally I would, I would say that uh, we all fly around the world, but that hasn't been happening very much in the last uh, year or so, um, only a few flights. Um, I haven't actually flown for a while now, and it's, uh, it's, it's kind of odd and strange that uh, I'm not. But when, the, when life is regular, uh, I do fly, and many of you fly, international flights, transatlantic flights, very long flights, short haul, long haul, whatever. And, and the, the idea is that uh, the end of the plane uh, is expected to be well maintained, is expected to be tested by the engineers before every flight, and is expected to be serviced at regular times that are regulated by the different authorities. And actually, the authority of the, the airline industry are very strict. They're very well internationally connected, so information flows from one side of the world to the other very, very quickly. And in fact, engineers know very well what each engine contains and uh, know exactly what every screw fits and they know exactly what they need to fix if something goes wrong. Now, let's move this whole same kind of framework into the, the, the setting of our, of our health systems and ask the question, how about information um, of health systems flowing, not only, let alone between countries or between continents, but just from one hospital to the next. And this is actually one of the big deficits that we have for one of the most important things in our life, which is actually to save lives, to keep people healthy. The information that we use is actually completely mismanaged. Uh, it's found in papers, in uh, documents, in PDFs, uh, in, in words rather than codes. And it's very, very difficult to share information. It's very difficult to detect patterns. And it's very difficult to actually capture uh, issues that <coughs> might arise uh, from uh, the use of medication or from any other issue that might, that might come up. You, you see, for example, how difficult it is to deal with the problem of uh, thrombosis uh, with the different vaccines, AstraZeneca and more recently Johnson & Johnson. Uh, and the reaction time, which is days, and there's all kinds of issues that uh, happen in heterogeneity of decision making. Go back three years ago when the when the 787 B Max uh, was actually uh, so 787 8 Max was sorry 737 8 Max was actually presenting problems. And if you remember, within three days, all plays were grounded in the world. And that tells you how badly we're doing it. Uh, the health, uh, the management of health data, the coordination of health systems, the way information flows is actually primitive relative to the industries that actually have a strong incentive, financial otherwise. So we need to change that. This is something that needs to change. And there's different ways to think about changing it. So how are we going to bring revolution in medicine? There's two ways to think about revolution because Evolution is not what we're looking for. We're not looking for incremental changes, but we're looking, for, we're looking for a potential of radical changes. First of all, advancing technology. We, know, we all know how technology is evolving in such a way that different interventions, different diagnostics, imaging is making it easier for clinicians to either look at a, a, the status, the health sta state of an individual or to intervene, uh, you know, surgery, uh, that, uh, you know, used to take, you know, 10 days of recovery now takes, you know, a couple of hours, uh, even a surgery from distance where there's a robot in one place of the world and there's a, a surgeon in the other place of the world and actually doing surgery from distance. Of course, you know, simple ones at the moment, but this is actually extremely promising. So this advanced technology will bring the, bring the revolution. But one other thing that is going to bring the revolution that we desperately need it is the actual understanding of human biology. In many cases in medicine these days, we're shooting in the dark. We don't really know what, what we're doing. We're testing uh, and we just basically doing trial and failure and see what works. And if it works, it works. And sometimes we don't know why it works. There's many medic medications that we're using currently where we don't fully understand the biology. We don't fully understand the consequences. And in some cases, we don't understand the interactions with other drugs with diseases and complications that might arise 
later. So the deep understanding of human biology is essential if you want to advance the way we do medicine these days. Now, of all the things that it would be important to know and understand, our genome is the most important. And of course, you know, I might say that because I'm a geneticist, this is what I think is the most important. But if you think about it, it actually makes sense. This is the most tangible, very specific, well-defined element that has an impact on our health. Everything else is kind of fluffy, you know, a bit of environment here, a bit of environment there, fluctuations of that environment. It's difficult to even measure things that you think you can measure. For example, if I ask you what you ate three days ago and just perfectly record the, 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 the input in your diet uh, three days ago, you probably won't remember uh, many things that you ate, either the coffee that you ate or, you know, some tiropita that you ate, uh, you know, in the morning or some cookie that somebody gave you. It's very difficult to record that. So environment is very, very difficult to capture. And in fact, it's correct because the environment by itself doesn't, doesn't have the same impact to everybody, it's just conditional on other things. So the same number of cigarettes will cause different problems to different people. So our genome is very specific. It's six billion letters. And to sort of make it simple, uh, how our genome is different from one individual to the other, think of a book. That book uh, is basically, it's a manually written book. Now I give it to five people here and I ask them to copy it from start to end. Uh, when people copy it, they will make some mistakes. As you indicated here, two of the books have, you know, a red mistake. And then that book is going to have that red mistake. And when I make, I, I give it to some more people, there's going to be some more mistakes uh, to, once they copy it. And then progressively mistakes will be on top of mistakes. And the accumulation of these mistakes are basically the mutations that we see these days. And so early mistakes are going to be shared by many people. Therefore, these form what we call the polymorphisms. Late mistakes are going to be these rare mutations that sometimes have an impact on disease. And in the vast majority of cases, this makes no difference to the meaning of the book. But in some cases, they do have a lot of change in the meaning, which, of course, can be seen as, a, as an impact on the phenotype or, more specifically, an impact changing risk of a disease or the manifestation of a disease. Now, what would ask the question, how much of the, of, of, of the variance of a disease is actually in the genome? So if, I, if somebody, if two people, um, if one person goes to the, to, 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 to the hospital and another one does not, how much of that difference is driven by their genome? And in fact, in general, about 50% of that etiology is due to the genome. So 50% of the reasons why one patient goes to the hospital and the other one doesn't is because of specific genomic changes. And that's an average effect. Of course, you know, in some diseases, there's a lot more than 50%. In others, it's a lot less than 50%. And, and, and what it, but, but the point here is that we have the ability to measure very well with, by spending a, a few hundred euros six billion letters that will give us 50% of the etiology of collectively all diseases an individual or the population might, might uh, experience. So that means that we actually have something well specific, very specific, well-defined, tangible and measurable uh, and actually not very expensive if you think that you're measuring it in a lifetime uh, that actually gives you 50% of the information. That's actually pretty astonishing and it has escaped the attention of most people considering the genome as a peripheral component of what we're trying to do today. Now, history, you know, genomics has been around in different flavors over the decades. You know, the most prominent uh, sort of start that one can put genomics, of course, the different ways of thinking about that start is 1953, where the DNA was revealed by uh, Watson and Crick, uh, which of course resulted in the Nobel Prize. And then, of course, we had a series of different, uh, um, you know, uh, let's say breakthroughs and, uh, and uh, milestones like, you know, DNA sequencing technology, uh, starting to, to sort of capture human variability, uh, sequencing the human genome. Um, if you remember, the human genome took more than a decade to be sequenced, and it cost more than $4 billion. Today, we can do it uh, for less than 1000 And then, of course, human, the variability of the human genome was progressively measured in different ways, and I'll 
come to that in a, in a few slides. And now we're at the point where we have actually used um, uh, the human variability in the genome to identify genetic factors of risk, which then links to disease and uh, brings us sort of different types of information into the, into the game. Now, for all these things, we need large data platform, data generation platforms. This shows some examples of our lab in, um, here in Geneva at the Genome Center that I'm, uh, I'm uh, happy to be the director of. And basically, these are some of the, the technologies, you know, large-scale sequencers, uh, uh, all kinds of other machines that allow for manipulation of samples, measurement, and all kinds of other things that are essential in order for all this data to come together. You know, we didn't have this kind of tools before, but these tools actually gave us the ability to do high throughput analysis of genomes in real time and in um, in basically very in a very accurate way. Now, one of the most uh, prominent methods of linking genetics with disease is this methodology called genome-wide association studies. And what this does is basically we're capturing all the variability in the genome, and we're doing this for thousands of people that have the disease and for thousands of people that are controlled that don't have the disease. And then we're contrasting the frequencies of the of specific variants in uh, uh, specific alleles between the two groups. And we see that there's an enrichment of an allele in the group of, of cases, in the group of uh, people that have the disease. We, ident we basically call that position an associated region. You see this green region here for Crohn's disease. This is back from a baby 2000. Seven from the case control, the Welcome Trust Case Control Consortium. One of the sort of the seminal uh, genome wide association studies, actually the most uh, uh, impactful genome wide association study to date that set the stage for in terms of not only in terms of, uh, you know, the, 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 the history of, uh, you know, what we can get with it, but how we do this. A lot of methodological advances. And, you know, this is just an older slide. I, I'm sorry I didn't change it, but. As of July 2017, actually, you know, which is a long time ago, we had 3,000 publications, about 44,000 variants that we know are associated with the trait. Today, we're looking at tens of thousands of publications, hundreds of thousands of variants. So this is something that um, that is very important. But genomics is not just our genome, and that's one of the things that we're starting to get more and more now. So as we're trying to capture also the environment, we're starting to realize that. Our, our, our environment is, is also, cons also cons mainly of genomes. What genomes? Well, if you want to capture this individual here, the multicolor individual with all these different tissues, what is the kind of environment for this person? You know, it's the parents that have, uh, that transmitted some of their genome to this individual, but they have actually transmitted only half of it, which means that there's a half of a genome in the mother and half the genome in the father, that is influencing, if it all influences behaviors and other aspects of the environment of their son or daughter, uh, but this has not been transmitted to that individual. That individual doesn't carry that genome. And that's actually very interesting. There, there is a study back in uh, about uh, you know seven or eight years ago that showed that non-heritable part of the genome of, of the mother has a, a, a very strong impact on the phenotype of a child. Uh, through different types of, of effects, including, of course, behavior, but not exclusively. Uh, but there's other genomes. There's a genomes of our, of our friends, you know, people that we socialize with, people that influence us. Uh, these are people close to us. Their genomes that are not, sh is not shared with us, is not identical by descent, affects our life. We have the, the genome of all the, the stuff that lives around us. You know, we can talk about animals, but mostly we can talk about the microbiota, the, the, the small communities of bacteria and viruses and, uh, and uh, other types of uh, microorganisms that live in ourselves and on ourselves uh, that influence the biology. You know, we know how much the gut microbiome affects our biology, our metabolism. In all this, which is actually an important fraction of, the, of our environment, can only be measured by genomics, which is quite astonishing because it kind of shows that it, with one measurement, one type of measurement, sequencing, we can capture not only the genome of the individual, which is the thing that we generally consider, but also the genome of our environment, which is a big fraction 
of our non-genetic contribution to our disease risk and so on. And to take it a bit further, just to show you how genomics is pervasive and important in our life, you all probably know the sustainable development goals of the United Nations, those 17 goals that we need to achieve by 20, 2030 uh, in order to basically you know, keep our society and our community at a healthy state, and that involves many, many things that you see on this map. And if you were to ask the question, for how many of these do we expect an impact by genomics, uh, you actually get about 13 of them. So in many different ways, genomics, either because of the information that it carries, Um, I'm going to mention two things. That one is health related, of course. We all know how in healthcare, sequencing genomes of, uh, for oncology or sequencing genomes for individuals that have a rare genetic disease can actually give us information on understanding the disease, but also intervening in certain uh, cancers to be able to have a, a better outcome. That's a health related issue. But there's another issue in terms of uh, marine life and monitoring. You know, we can use genetics and genomics to capture the state of, of, of diversity of, of a community. And of course, level of diversity is quite important to its sustainability. So genetics actually captures that diversity and it's a very important marker to see how things are going and also do this longitudinally so that uh, it allows us for decision-making when certain parameters are actually affecting that level of diversity. So, Genomes are, are connected to our world in many, many different ways. And if one projects in the future now and asks, especially on, from the health side, where are we going to go? And this slide was actually made back in 2018. And I, this is actually not by mistake. I intentionally put it here just to make the point. Back in 2018, I was projecting that by 2021, we're going to have genetic risk of common disease units used in the clinic. So basically, all these genetic factors that we found, or not all of them, but some of them that we have shown that they have clinical utility will be used for uh, assessment of somebody's uh, future health state, somebody's risk, and will be used as an early intervention for prevention so that people don't develop that disease or at least don't develop severe disease. You know, these days we actually have this manifestation. Uh, for example, um, a few months ago, there was a, a clinic for uh, created at, at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital, MGH, uh, for uh, cardiovascular disease polygenic risk scores, where people are using this information uh, to actually make decisions about uh, their, um, not their future health, but what kind of decisions they need to make now to prevent a cardiovascular disease. We already have a FinGen, um, a big project in Finland, using this kind of information in 650,000 people uh, uh, to actually genotype them, make risk assessments, and then inform them and so well, this is actually making a difference in their life and they're seeing extremely good results up to now. And there's a number of other private clinics that actually start to progressively bring this forward for, as I said, cardiovascular disease, there's a breast cancer component to the and probably other cancers like, for example, colorectal cancer and so on. But we're getting into the, the framework of genetic alterations in vivo, the ability to intervene in the genome. And, in some ways, we experienced this, this, these days with the COVID vaccine. What we did was we actually intervened in the biology of our cells by expressing ectopically the spike protein by injecting the, this, this very well, you know, extensively discussed mRNA uh, through the, um, the, um, uh, the vaccines. And of course, that protein was produced in order to then uh, trigger immune reaction. That's some kind of a sort of um, a transient genetic alteration. We can think of with CRISPR-Cas9 and other similar technologies that we can do more stable alterations that will be able to intervene in cancers and uh, probably other tissues that have a particular, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, properties that we want to change. As an example, um, uh, in Boston, there's a study right now that um, is, is piloting uh, the uh, the, the direct modification from a normal state to a knockout state of the gene PCSK9 in, a, in, in human liver in order to, to lower uh, the level of cholesterol. If you, if you probably you know, 
when PCSK9 is actually knocked out, so it's non-functional in humans, then the level of cholesterol is extremely low. And so this startup wants to actually intervene in a living individual to change PCSK9 exclusively in the liver and no other tissue in order to lower the level of cholesterol. And they're doing this with basically with specific uh, uh, specific vectors that will then go and CRISPR-Cas9 modifications in our hepatocytes in in uh, in, in in vivo, which is a, a rather uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, it, it seems like a rather risky experiment, but it already works actually very well in mice, and it works very well in, uh, as far as I know in primates. And then we can see you know progressively building molecular profiles that will inform uh, drug combinations and a whole bunch of things. Essentially, the capturing of our molecular state is going to be very important in the near future. Now, in order to get all that, we need to catalog variation. We have a project uh, that actually has ended a few years ago called Thousand Genomes. We had the first attempt to capture global variability, but, but basically to, to capture this lightly, not to capture it uh, deep, but to do this uh, widely in different populations around the planet. And then what you do is you do this population association. This is what I told you before, where basically you take um, uh, and you, you try to see the difference between a situation where uh, essentially those individuals are actually in the average versus individuals that are uh, uh, enriched for a particular DNA marker, which means that you have this what we call a genetic association that uh, is behind the methodology of genome-wide association studies. This is an example, a more specific example of what I showed you before. Three regions here, um, uh, not just of Crohn's disease, this is bipolar disorder on the left, uh, cardiovascular disease, coronary artery disease, and then Crohn's disease on the right. And these are some examples of the picture that you see when you do these genetic association studies. But doing the association study is not enough. You Just capturing the... Uh, the genetic marker is not enough because all it gives you is statistical signal. What we need to understand is what's the biology behind it. What are the genes? What are the processes that are affected in order for an individual to have an, 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 an increased risk? And this doesn't happen just on the DNA. It happens in cells where basically these variants have an effect. And this effect is probably present in all individuals that have a particular, that have this, this allele, even if they don't eventually develop the disease. It happens in organs and tissues. And of course, when it's manifesting as a disease, it's present in the organism. And keep in mind that these effects of these variants are happening in, in two dimensions. They're happening in space. That means that they're happening in different tissues and in different developmental states of, 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 the, of the tissues. So there's diversity. So they may have one effect in one tissue and a different effect in another tissue. But they also happen over time. Because of developmental time as well as aging, we also see these variants changing their effect over time. And sometimes, if you don't capture the biological effect at the right time, you don't capture it at all. And you're not able to see what really drove the, the, the risk behind a specific variant. What is more interesting is now we're starting to see that just capturing the effect in a tissue is not sufficient because what we think is, what we thought was a homogeneous set of cells is now becoming a much more uh, heterogeneous set of, of, of individual cells that they have individual uh, sort of behavior. And of course, this this expected some kind of stochasticity in that behavior. But actually, in some cases, there's increased variance or decreased variance relative to the expectation. And we're starting to see that too much variance among cells. So too many cells that are different from each other in what otherwise looks like a normal tissue uh, is actually could be detrimental for the organ because it, it, it basically illustrates some degree of instability. So just having the same mean among a thousand cells doesn't mean that the state of the cells is the same. The variance actually matters quite a lot. What we need in order to capture somebody's state is we need all these multiple layers of data. We need molecular levels. We need the information at the patient level before they become patient. We need this to happen in time, not just in space. And we need this to happen in, by capturing, uh, you know, different individuals in different environmental states, but well as a different genetic states. And by that I mean you know, uh, different uh, populations, different 
ethnicities, different genetic backgrounds. You probably know the project GTEx that tried to get very deep into the biology of this by looking at, um, at 950 individuals, 950 actually post-mortem donors with the attempt to get uh, as much molecular information as was possible. Initially, it was basically whole genome sequencing for everybody, about 30 tissues post-mortem sampled, and uh, these were RNA sequenced. And we had information like proteomics, methylation, chromatin. So basically as deep as possible uh, for tissues that we don't generally have access to in a living individual. That's actually one of the big problems. Capturing biological effects in tissues at the population level, we cannot biopsy those tissues. For example, brain tissues. We cannot biopsy easily brain tissue from, individu from living individuals. And even if we do, the amounts are very small and very heterogeneous. At the end of the day, we need to go to a, a sample a lot and in time to see change. Because just capturing a state, even when we have control for age, is not enough. For example, if you take blood pressure, right? Uh, blood pressure are the normal ranges, but if somebody has very low blood pressure and that goes into a medium level blood pressure within a short time, even if it stays within the normal, the change actually signifies something important. So change is always an indication that something is different now, maybe wrong, usually it's wrong, sometimes it can be a good thing, but actually understanding how it evolved over time, over the age of an individual, gives you quite a bit of an indication of the trajectory that an individual is in and gives you some projection of where this is gonna go, even if in that particular moment that you measure it, it's actually in the normal range. That's quite important to understand because sometimes, you know, we go to the doctor, we measure something, it's normal, and then we think that's okay, but it's not okay. We need to measure it multiple times to see how it changes over time. So what do we need to get all that? How do we, what do we need to get? We need a lot of things. And what I'm gonna tell you in the next few minutes is basically how we are approaching this in, in, in Switzerland with the different, uh, the different aspects of uh, infrastructure that we have through the Health 2030 Genome Center. So what we need is uh, coordinated efforts. We need centralized uh, data generation platforms in order to be able to bring the latest technology. We need the integration of electronic health record data with the molecular data. We need centralized data management systems and analysis for hospitals, but also in a basic setting. And we need the coordination of the community uh, not only the clinical community, but also the research community. What do we do in the Genome Center is we actually brought uh, many of the experiences that we we have seen and uh, some of us have seen very closely from different efforts in uh, in the international setting, for example, in the UK and the US. Uh, there's different, uh, the UK in particular has done an amazing job with the, the, thousand, the, the, the 100,000 genomes a project called Genomics England, alternatively, that has completely transformed NHS and has brought forward the genomics as a key tool for pretty much every disease, but in particular oncology and rare disease. We need to bring advanced and research and technology uh, and because now we actually have all these tools at a much different state that we had, uh, you know, 10 years ago. And in some cases, Switzerland has uh, many advantages, uh, but also many deficits to overcome. Each country has its own benefit, advantages and disadvantages. And that's why every time you put an infrastructural system like that, you need to take into account where, where this country starts from and what are the key they can bring forward that are unique and can not only can offer a unique opportunity for the transformation of its own health system, but how this can actually bring uh, uh, benefit to the rest of the world. So the Health 2030 initiative is a multi-centering, multidisciplinary initiative uh, it's basically regional and what we call kind of the center west Switzerland, starting Bern, Lausanne, and Geneva, with all hospitals and universities of these three cities involved in this process. The idea is to promote research, education, and services in, in the context of personalized health. And I'm broadening it up from medicine because what we're interested in is prevention by bringing all technologies and also infrastructure uh, of hospitals and uh, research in the same setting. And the idea would be to not only do this by specifically achieving uh, specific goals with respect to services and, and research, 
but also to create a culture uh, in academic and clinical environments, but beyond that too, you know, financial, industrial, political uh, environments, because all these things are needed as partners in the advancement of this of this initiative. Here's some sort of uh, sort of key keywords that are brought together and the different people behind it. It's actually a large community that is brought forward in order to be able to uh, to actually achieve our goals. Of course, genomics and informatics are at the center of all this, but there's a lot of different aspects that need to be taken into account. For example, ethics, law, sociology, health economics, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's, a, there's a different types of budget. I'm giving you previous rounds, there's a new round now. Uh, for 2021 and forward, that is about the same numbers. But basically, we're talking about tens of millions of Swiss francs. I cannot say that they're used very efficiently. It's actually one of the problems when you have a very large community, uh, especially in a dem democratic setting, it's somehow difficult to, to make decisions because there's so many things to be done. Um, but there's a lot of money that is being brought by the federal government, uh, either directly to uh, a project called Swiss personal network that manages a certain part of the money, or the ETH domain, these are the polytechnic schools, uh, primarily in uh, Zurich and Lausanne, that have another round, another chunk of funding that supports specific types of projects. This shows you the organogram of the <coughs> Swiss personal life and network, where you see the different layers. <coughs> it's actually driven by the Swiss Academy of Medical Sciences, and uh, is all, the oversight is at the General Secretary of Research and Innovation, the equivalent of Yeyek uh, uh, now in, uh, in, in Greece. And the Swiss National Science Foundation is, is a significant part of it. Uh, so the Genome Center is bringing the genomics arm of all this effort. Uh, we actually have the, the most late, we want to bring genomic analysis, both from the technological point of view, in order to be able to do large scale analysis, the scale generation of data, but also to do data analysis of this data. And the idea was to bring it with clinical data and actually bring it forward for reimbursement by the, by the private insurances. Here in Switzerland, the system is private insurances in an otherwise generally public uh, uh, hospital system. Uh, and uh, this reimbursement is really quite important in order to be able to, to bring it forward because without reimbursement, it's extremely difficult to, uh, to promote that as a, as a solution if people have to pay out of pocket. This was actually you know, quite a while ago when it was uh, uh, basically created with the help of a lot of people, in particular two key figures that you see in the photo, Didier Trono and, uh, and Denis Strasser, uh, who has now retired uh, from the FFL and the University of Geneva, effectively. Uh, this links quite a big, it's actually the, the, the Genome Center is in Geneva, but it links uh, quite a bit of Switzerland, as I said, Bern, Lausanne, and Geneva. And of course, it starts to have interactions with centers in Zurich and so on. So it progressively becomes kind of a national center of interest. Here are the, the different institutions uh, that are implicated. This is our building. Uh, you know, this is not our building in the sense that this is where we are. This is our building that we use 100%. We actually use two for that building uh, for, uh, uh, for our services both for data generation as well as the, the data analysis part. And uh, the, as I said, the idea is to create this, to make this a leading house for genomic medicine in Switzerland, but also in Europe, uh, progressively as precision medicine becomes important for all of European health systems. And of course, as genomics becomes, as it should become, the key element of this, uh, of the precision medicine strategy. Uh, there's different sources of funding, you know, we're talking about uh, donations, other partners, funding that comes with small grants, uh, partnership with sequencing companies. It's a very complex network of, of interactions, which you can imagine makes a very complex life for, uh, for uh, uh, basically us to, to be able to manage the funding and the activities and the interactions with all these, uh, with all these different uh, aspects. So this is an interesting exercise. I think anybody who's in this, in this world is, is actually facing. This is uh, sort of another dimension. I won't go into detail, but essentially we want to create a hub that uh, brings all the technological aspects together and the data analysis and the research community. 
Uh, this is sort of another view of the building that I showed you before, where the, the, the two floors of the genome center are found. And here's some of the photos that I showed you before. We actually have also a Nova 6, uh, 6000 that are the latest machine that can do high, uh, high throughput uh, whole genome analysis at a relatively affordable price in a few hundreds of euros uh, per genome at a very high coverage and, of course, very high accuracy. This is where we hit on that uh, or big organogram, but, of course, this red part that is very focused actually touches on many, many different components. It's actually this by itself as a network is a very complex network of interactions. The lines that you are connected is just, just a few of the key ones, but there's a lot of other interactions. It becomes a, and you know, that's one of the reasons that these are difficult things to establish because it is, and it takes a bit of time to get all these people to speak the same language and aim the same goal, even if they're conceptually aiming for the same thing, which is to actually bring precision medicine and precision health to, to the health system. So what we want to do is foster all these, all these things. And, uh, uh, and, and we actually are involved in more projects these days. And we have starting to reach our goal. Uh, and we're sequencing more and more genomes. You know, you can also see the opportunities that arise. For example, the Genome Center was set up for human genome sequencing. But because of the COVID pandemic, we were called uh, to take uh, basically uh, more than 50% of the Swiss uh, surveillance uh, uh, sequencing for, for, for the virus. And we're doing about 750 genomes per week at the Genome Center. We recently passed the milestone of 10,000 genomes. And basically the, the standard report now of the Swiss government on the, on the, on the percentage of uh, different variants of the virus, not just the British one, but others, is actually coming primarily for data that we contribute uh, to the, to the uh, public health office. This is basically a simplistic organogram where we have a strategic board. Uh, there's a director and a co-director, different types of pe key people, like chief operations officer who runs the platform, chief information officer who runs all the IT infrastructure and the data analysis. We have research lab associated with the genome center, the sequencing platform, the, 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 uh, the, intellect, the, um, the information technology, all the, the data analysis, and of course, the, the infrastructure behind it. And we have also a, a small component at the moment of sequencing of technology development. All these are linked with uh, specific infrastructures like the Swiss Data Science Center, the Swiss Informatics, and so on. At the end of the day, if one wants to summarize what we want to do is we want to bring clinical information into research and back. I think that the, the main idea is that if you want to do build precision medicine and bring it as sort of our in a daily life in the clinic so that it completely changes the way uh, patients are being treated and improves the success for the treatment of a patient, what we need to achieve is to bring a research mentality into the daily treatment of a patient. So to basically make each patient a research project. That for me is the basically the uh, asymptotic goal of, uh, of precision medicine. In some ways, uh, and my father is a was a doctor and um, you know, he, you know, we discussed this many times. Of course, every patient is seen as a different patient, but patients are grouped and in very large groups in the past. What we're missing is longitudinal and other aspects of dimensions and of, of progression of disease and dimensions of differential between tissues and between other diseases that are essentially important. And at some point, doctors have a hard time coding on this and taking this into account, especially as health systems become very busy. So it is important to code this to actually make this more uh, tangible, uh, well-documented, in a data analysis platform that assists doctors, not doesn't replace doctors, in order for these decisions to be made with more information, more accurately, and more systematically, leading to better outcomes for everybody. So thank you very much. That was that all I had to say, and I'm happy to discuss any anything that uh, you might want to discuss uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Domitzakis. It has been a pleasure listening to all this 
uh, intriguing information for quite a few researchers around the world. Uh, precision medicine is still uh, an unexplored field, so it is always interesting to hear uh, how things uh, are progressing. I will now invite our attendees to raise their hands or uh, pose their questions uh, on our forum. We already have some questions in the forum and I will now be forwarding them to you. And uh, Krisa Kokotido will also be uh, sending us questions from our streaming uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube. Uh, before going into the attendees question, I would like to to add another perspective to this discussion, and uh, we have some comments here uh, that are going to, to support uh, uh, what I'm about to say. So I think that uh, genomics um, has this challenge when we're trying to link it to everyday clinical practice. The first thing you need to consider uh, is uh, the actual uh, biomarkers and in vitro diagnostics that we are going to, uh, to use uh, to make genomics uh, applicable for uh, to doctors, to medical doctors, working into hospitals, working very close to patients. So uh, what, is, uh, what is your understanding? What is your feeling? It is not easy from a regulatory perspective, at least, uh, to have uh, procedures that are speeding um, a launch of these products into the market. And we are usually uh, uh, find ourselves in a situation where we hear a lot of research going on uh, on a research level, but then this research never uh, manages to come into the market and actually provide a clinical benefit to patients. So do you think uh, in the future, in the near future, uh, we're going to see this change? Well, I, I think you're right, but I think that uh, the problem is, is actually the regulatory authorities and the regulatory framework rather than the information itself. I think that medicine has become very much guideline oriented and is getting more and more guideline oriented where if you don't have a threshold and a guideline, you cannot do medicine. And that is actually the thing that goes against what I said before, which is a research mentality. Research, research doesn't have guidelines. And the ability to evaluate a situation in real time cannot be done guidelines because guidelines are, are designed for averages. They're not designed for individuals. And therefore, uh, I think this is what we need to do. I mean, you know, we're talking about artificial intelligence, right? Artificial intelligence doesn't think of guidelines either. Uh, so in some ways, if we, if we remove this guideline-oriented view of the world and we keep guidelines only for when it matters and we are able to interpret real-time signals uh, when they're combined, but we interpret them not by having a human brain do this, which is very difficult to do, but with the assistance of computers, I think we will be able to bring more value into that kind of information. Uh, but even in the guideline specific way that we work, there's a lot of information that can be brought forward. In oncology, in rare disease, in, um, in extreme uh, phenotypes, we have a lot of information to bring. And I think one of the problems is that in that respect, even when there's, the guidelines are appropriate, is that people have been perceiving genetic information differently from cholesterol. For example, people are happy to throw a paper of their cholesterol exam on the street and uh, because it, the air took it and somebody will pick it up and read the level of cholesterol of somebody, but they will be freaking out to even do a genetic test, let alone lose it on the street so somebody else can look at it. And in fact, cholesterol is much more clinically relevant. And from a, let's say, from a life insurance point of view, would be more impactful in terms of changing your premium than your genetic test. So we need to understand that information, clinical information, is clinical information. So the same way you feel comfortable about making decisions on x rays, on cholesterol, on um, uh, any imaging that we that we do, uh, measurement of PSA and all the other things that we have, we should be making similar decisions when we have genetic information. When we break that and we don't consider genetics as a as an odd type of data, then I think we will actually understand it. And it's 
very psychological. I think there's no science behind the differential treatment of genetic information. That's a very interesting perspective. Thank you for this. So uh, I'm uh, moving forward to our questions. First of all, we've got Christina Kakia from Malta. She was the first to, to ask a question here, and I'm reading. Uh, Professor Dermijakis, are you expecting a change in genomic expression in the post-COVID era, given that COVID has an effect on everybody's environment? Well, there would be. I mean, I already know that COVID progression is affected by by genetics. Actually, some genetic markers individually have as much of an effect as uh, uh, underlying conditions like diabetes, for example, or obesity. Uh, and this has nothing to do with those underlying conditions. They're having to do with the way our immune system works. And so that's one part, which is the immediate part. But I think that what we still are very lightly discussing, and I think we'll discuss more once we're over this pandemic and the, the acute phase of it, is basically the chronic phase of the pandemic, which is basically dealing with the long COVID, dealing with all the consequences of people that have, uh, have uh, uh, had serious disease, uh, have developed severe complications, some of them severe complications because of the hospitalization per se. Being intubated is not a fun thing, and it certainly leaves you with some uh, consequences that you need to deal with. But even the infection, all the consequences, the thrombosis that happens, all the different uh, organs that fail, those things will leave marks. And we need to see, first of all, where the specific genetic backgrounds that are more affected, specific sort of genetic uh, polymorphisms make people more susceptible for this to happen, as well as for the progression and the improvement of the situation. But certainly, it's going, to, it's going to be in a whole other field. I think that one thing we're not measuring yet is the cost of our health system as a result of long COVID, which to me is going to be in the order of 5 to 10% more. So suddenly having a 5 to 10% more cost in, in our health system is going to be, I think, devastating. And we need ways of dealing with it to make health systems more efficient. And using genomics is one way to do that. Thank you. Uh, Risa, I have one more question on the forum and then I'm coming to you with your uh, questions. Uh, from Apostolos Papachristos, a clinical pharmacology fellow at the University of Chicago. Professor Dermijakis, is project also targeting to promote and implement pharmacogenomics in personalized therapeutics? Of course. Everything that uses genomic information for decision making in the clinic is, is, is included, including pharmacogenomics. Absolutely. Risa, well, States is yours. Professor, thank, Any you. Questions? thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, actually, there are no questions uh, through YouTube and Facebook, but I would like to make a question, like a general question. So I totally understand that uh, personalized medicine has uh, some uh, huge advantages, not only for the patient, but also uh, for economy. And correct me if that is uh, wrong. Uh, and I would like to ask you, I mean, can you make like a high estimate, like, like a, an estimation of when a personalized medicine would be widely available? I mean, not also worldwide, but also in Greece. I mean, just an estimation. Well, it depends. Right? I mean, widely available, very, it's basically kind of like a vicious cycle, right? It can be available today if we wanted it to be available. The technology is there. I think the means are there, the knowledge is there, and there, the experts are there. I think we have a hesitation to bring it in. So it's a bit of a sort of a chicken and egg kind of situation where we're sort of chasing and until something breaks through. Uh, some countries like the UK have already done it. And, and unfortunately, this has this political decision. You know, the reason that the UK has done it was David Cameron, who actually had a kid with a severe genetic disease, decided to invest 270 million pounds on a project that I mentioned called Genomics England which then transformed the NHS. Now the NHS has a national genomic service that basically transforms completely the way they, they use information of genetics in the clinic. Uh, actually, they've changed even the way they do pathology because in the NHS, because they, they don't sample any more uh, paraffin embedded samples, but they actually sample frozen material in order to be used for genetic analysis, which I understand in the clinics is a very, very difficult thing to implement. But the NHS is changing that too. So it takes a lot of changes for this to happen. 
there are glimpses of that. For example, there are some services in, uh, in Greece right now that would offer polygenic risk course. It's early days for that. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be collaborating with one of them uh, for some of it, like cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. Uh, there's other services in, in other places in the world, but it's still, uh, it's still sporadic. Uh, very few countries have a, an organized system that implements that in the health system. As I said, UK has it, Finland starts to have it, uh, US starting to do a project in order to implement it. It's a slow process. Uh, Greece has also a couple of projects of precision medicine in oncology and cardiovascular disease. But one of the problems that I see there is they're a bit disconnected from clinics. They seem to be very research oriented. But and, and they haven't managed to link with the clinics. And that's because, uh, as it happens in actually many countries, research and health are different ministries. Uh, and they're actually sometimes even competing. We see that in Switzerland too. And so sometimes they don't actually put the money together to do something in a coordinated fashion. There's all these sort of glitches of the political system that because you need support of the political system for this to happen in a smooth and seamless way. Thank you very much for the answer. So I have, uh, I see a lot of questions popping. I'm really happy to see them. So we have Maria Cristina Escobar and she would like to know if your project is adding nanotechnology for genomics research. Nanotechnology for genomics research. I'm not yeah, sure exactly uh, Maria Cristina Escobar, uh, you could raise your hand and take, uh, take the stand if you would like uh, to be more specific. Um, I'm going to move forward with another question and then... Uh, there is uh, a raise hand uh, feature on your right, if you haven't seen, and you can call it in the, on stage, should you wish to participate uh, and ask uh, directly Professor Jackis. Okay, Vicky, or uh, Chrisa, please go on with the questions. Okay. okay. Uh, he's thanking you for this presentation and uh, we have his comment. Personalized medicine is the only way forward to the future. At the same time, health systems need to harness the genomic information as early as possible and treat patients in a proactive, preemptive manner, not reactive. Absolutely. That's the point. You know, we need to be looking at prevention. Prevention is the best way to deal with health. Uh, it's cheaper. Sometimes it sounds expensive because prevention involves everybody, while treatment involves only sick people. The problem is that, uh, for example, sequencing a genome um, happens once in a lifetime, and it helps in, in terms of assessing your risks. If, if everybody that was to, were to be admitted to the hospital, we have to sequence a genome, eventually we sequence all genomes because everybody goes to the hospital for one reason or another even if it's an accident. So if we actually have an organized prevention by dealing with multi the multiplicity of, of the potential diseases, it's significantly cheaper uh, than having to deal with treating those patients. At the same time, patients are healthy. So it's a win-win. People are healthier and the system suffers less. Krisha, would you like to ask uh, the other questions from our forum? Yeah, sure. We have so, uh, Thank you. next question is from uh, Kay Karakostis. And uh, it's, uh, would, you would you support the view that the clinical implementation of genomic findings is primarily based on biostatistical results, for example, p-values of polymorphism or patients, requires further experimental research at the cellular and biochemical level? Not always. Uh, it does and it should follow, of course, that when we're trying to understand the specific mechanism. But at the same time, if I have very strong statistical evidence that a particular genetic marker tells me about the risk of an individual to develop a disease, then I don't need necessarily a, a downstream experiments to, to prove anything. There's one fundamental thing that, uh, you know, I'm sure some of the people will disagree, but um, I want to assure them that this is like what we call an axiom in mathematics. A genetic association, so the association of a genetic variant 
with the phenotype is by definition causal. Okay, it's not like the correlations that you get in epidemiology where you have like cholesterol and something else and they're correlated and you don't know whether they're correlated independently or one causes the other, you don't know the, the, co the causation direction. Genetics to phenotype is always unidirectional for a very simple reason. The genome is established at the zygote when there's no phenotype and that zygote, the genome of the zygote stays on for the rest of the life of the organism. All the types downstream are changing, they're being modified. Therefore, the, and you know, I, there's a more complex way to prove it, but it's a causal relationship, which means that when I have that association, even if I don't know the intermediate biology between the variant and the eventual phenotype, I have a causal relationship that I can use. And therefore, it's very useful as a marker to the degree that the statistics are enough for that. Sometimes the statistics are not enough, and I need to understand the biology because the biology will tell me, for example, things that I can use for drug design, for drug development, and so on. So it, the biology is very important, but it's not always essential for genomics to be used in the clinics. Okay, so I'm moving on to the next question uh, from Vasilis uh, Pizzicalis. Uh, and uh, Professor Tamizakis, what do you think is the role of machine learning, computational intelligence, like leveraging its power and taking advantage of the huge amounts of data that process with Nobel bioinformatic pipelines, of course, with uh, the appropriate care? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a nice part. We're talking about data analysis. I, but if you go specifically to artificial intelligence, we need to be, be careful. We don't do many times, and this is, that's actually a misunderstanding that causes problems. We tend to think that artificial intelligence is basically we, we, we're giving a system, a computer system data, and the system makes a decision in a black way for a patient. So we give data for that person, they tell us to do this, we give data for the other person, they tell us to do that. That's not generally what happens. Artificial intelligence is generally used for the model definition. So we have a lot of rich data, and we use artificial intelligence to understand the, 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 the parameters of, 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 and the properties of, of the people that have the disease, the biological properties, the, the parameters that are influencing, the variables that are important and so on. And once we know that, then the use in the clinic becomes simpler. So I'm a very big proponent of using artificial intelligence for the discovery of the model, but the model needs to be transparent. I am not the proponent, I'm actually completely against the idea of artificial intelligence as a means to make clinical decisions. I think this is, this is risky, and it's going to put us into a space where we will be making decisions that we don't understand. So artificial intelligence is important. All data analysis methods are very important. But we need to be careful how we use it. And I think in the mass majority of cases, artificial intelligence is used in the right way, and it has a lot of impact. OK, and uh, last question is, uh, um, Lisa, we have another comment on machine learning by Dimitrios Kuzukas from ah, yes, I missed that. He's, uh, he's thanking mm -hmm. you for uh, your presentation, Professor, and he's saying it may be the immediate future with personalized medicine on based data mining, machine learning of uh, EHR and claims data rather than genetic data because this is using existing infrastructures. Good luck mining the electronic health record data. I think that this is a promise that has been going on for about four decades. There's billions of dollars spent on this, and good luck organizing the data. Do you know how many days I've been hearing repeatedly the interoperability of clinical data? And this is actually a myth, and there's a myth for a very specific reason. I mentioned this very briefly in the talk. Clinical data is not properly coded. In order to be able to do integration and use data from different sources, it needs to be coded in the same way. When a patient presents certain symptoms, those symptoms need to be coded in the same way. And even when I use this ICD-10 codes, that's not enough to capture the information. Electronic records have you know, long text that need to be mined. They're found in PDFs, people even you know, express themselves differently. So 
while clinical data is very important, at the end of the day, what is useful is only a tiny fraction of that clinical data is available. There's one reason for that, why this data is such a mess, because all the systems that have been collecting clinical data have not been designed for integration across individuals. They have been designed to capture one individual longitudinally. So as long as one doctor can read in that clinical record for, I don't know, 20 years, all the information and the progression of one or multiple diseases, and they can interpret that information to make the next decision, those systems work well. But because it's within each individual, that information is not comparable between individuals. And that becomes extremely difficult exercise to then do population-based studies. So there's been billions of dollars literally spent on that, and invariably it has failed. What we need to do now is we need to step back, use as much electronic health record data as we can that is properly coded so that we can link it with other parameters, but actually measure those parameters that are structured, comparable, like genomics. All of six billion letters, we all have the, almost the same position in the genome that we can compare to. We have almost all the same genes. It's actually comparable components. And so that's why I'm saying that it would have been great if clinical data was coded properly. We can do it from now on, but it's going to take another 10 years <laughs> to accumulate the appropriate data. But right now, that myth that the infrastructure exists, meaning the data exists, is, is, is true theoretically, but extremely difficult in practice to, to implement. If I may uh, jump sure. on this uh, debate and this discussion, it's uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, garbage in, garbage out uh, in data and uh, in initial data, uh, as we discussed before in this question. Uh, the thing is that if we manage to, 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 to uh, get the correct data, to develop the correct models, and uh, uh, then approach the various, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it could be uh, uh, perhaps a different uh, result, a different outcome. Sure. And uh, I would like to ask you, what is your uh, impression about AlphaFold? About what? AlphaFold. Do you know AlphaFold? Uh, DeepMind? Uh, uh, that's an AI analytical. Oh, tool. yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have very it's, direct it's, experience with that too. To have right. an impression myself. So, in the in general, you say that artificial intelligence is something that cannot be at this moment. No, no, no. I didn't say. It has... I, I said. I said the following. I said yeah. that artificial intelligence, in my opinion, is very useful to uh, to be used on research data or uh, let's say training data to find the right model so that that model is being used then in, uh, in, um, in, in clinics. I'm very worried about using artificial intelligence in real time, making decisions in real time to treat patients from outcome of artificial intelligence. That's the thing I'm worried about. It may be that at some point we stabilize that and we know what we are, but because uh, I don't think that we have a very good understanding of the the stability of the decision-making process, given the sparsity and the heterogeneity of our data, it, putting an artificial intelligence uh, platform as a way to make a decision, let's say to operate or not on a patient, as an outcome of an artificial intelligence platform, uh, a pipeline, I, I would be very worried to do. That's the point. I see. We have to start at some point. The, let's say when we were at the uh, at the first steps of the basic, let's say, research, uh, we haven't a, a, a general strategy or an idea how we can come up. Maybe this happens as well uh, nowadays with this uh, with these new tools uh, of artificial intelligence and the info, uh, let's say, uh, technologies. Uh, it's quite uh, interesting, and let's see how it goes. I mean, it's very, look, look, it's very, it's very interesting. It's very appealing. It's cool and exciting. But at the end of the day, there's a life of a person that depends on that decision. So we we're need to be very there. sure. I mean, the problem with, I mean, you know, we're talking about very broadly, of course. 
about okay. artificial intelligence. And you know, it depends also how we define efficiency. Some people are define linear regression as artificial intelligence. So it depends, you know, what exactly we mean by that. But uh, what what I mean is that when we have uh, situations where there's a lot of data that is sparse and heterogeneous with different levels of, of let's say, quality, and we're trying to learn something from it in order to make a decision for a person's life, it becomes risky because we don't know the stability of that decision-making process. Small changes in variables can lead to opposing decisions because the data itself is unstable. For personalized medicine, somehow, as you refer, we are far away as well sure, with the tradition sure. of biology. But I'm, I'm, but I'm, for, point, I'm yeah, in sure. favor of artificial intelligence in principle. All right, great. We are both of us. <laughs> I have an interesting comment from... Biology. Sorry, Vicky, please go on. Oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm saying that we're having a very interesting comment from Dimitris Kuzukas, uh, saying that indeed uh, artificial intelligence should be treated as a decision this support tool Dimitris and not a This is the platform that we're using here. Do not uh, invite... Uh, Kresha, can you please invite yes. Dimitris from stage? Or let me check how we're going to uh, give us his thoughts. But as uh, we expect, uh, Dimitris, uh, uh, my question is whether we should come together, I mean, the, the informaticians somehow uh, and the uh, biologists, uh, the, this interdisciplinary mode, uh, in order to design the new system biology and uh, uh, try to uh, have some answers uh, for the future. I mean, we have a lot of things to do in order to, we have to come up with a strategy as to uh, proceed in the future and uh, use all these wonderful tools and uh, real uh, life medicine and uh, uh, precision medicine and personalized medicine, please. I mean, you know, we, we certainly we need need collaboration at all levels. I think we need a framework in order to do that and beyond, and we need the interdisciplinary framework. Just, you know, systems biology by informaticians, that's, it's a very close framework. I think we need much more than that to be able to achieve what we want to achieve. I think we're not missing the methodologies, we're not missing the modeling, what we're missing is how this can become useful and mm -hmm. how we can, we can um, assess the clinical utility of such methodologies because it's not, just, it's not just about whether they're useful. I think they are useful, but because they're different from what have been used before, the assessment of clinical utility is more difficult and sometimes because it's difficult, it's outright rejected before even being tested. I have so, invited Christian, we Dimitris. Have... Dimitris is uh, on stage. Please unmute uh, Dimitri, and uh, you may use your video as well and uh, uh, ask your question or say your comment. Hi. Um, thank you for inviting me on board. I um, so I, I sort of joined in the uh, middle of this. I was having uh, technical problems, as you see. My video is off. I'm a little bit uh, bandwidth limited at the moment. Um, yeah, I was just I was just uh, making a comment that, uh, and I, I agree with you perfectly. Decision support tools are not a substitute for uh, doctor's professional judgment. I think mm -hmm. that the uh, developers of these uh, of the uh, me these machine learning tools and these algorithms, uh, what they, they don't intend it to uh, replace um, the uh, doctor's decision making. Exactly, I fully agree, I, and I think that in some ways it's also important for for the for the for the strategy of it because. If, if there's a fear that doctors will lose their job because they're being replaced by computers, it does two things. First of all, it turns off patients because they will be freaking out, thinking that the machine will make the decision instead of a doctor that they can talk to. And secondly, doctors are disincentivized. They, they will always block this kind of developments from becoming part of the, of the, of the platform. And so this is something we need to be careful about uh, to play also the right diplomacy and strategy so that we can implement all these things for the benefit of, of the patients at the same time uh, keeping the doctors, uh, have the, the buy-in of the doctors uh, into this process. 
But actually, uh, even nowadays uh, in uh, in the states, they use Watson in order the clinicians, the doctors, they use uh, Watson in order to take their decisions. So artificial intelligence somehow can assist. Let's say, sure. is that correct? Whatever Watson is doing, I, I personally don't have a, a high appreciation of Watson, but yeah, I know. <laughs> there are a lot of you. <laughs> it is a system that people can use, but um, yes, it's it's, yeah. that is correct. Professor, we have one more question uh, as we're heading to the end of this very intriguing discussion. And I have From one at the end, please, uh, Vicky, don't uh, forget me. No, no, I will not. Uh, Constantina Stathopoulou, she's thanking you for this nice talk, and would like to uh, to add to the equation epigenetic modifications of the genome. And uh, she's asking, shouldn't it be integrated along with whole genome sequencing in an effort to personalize medicine? Sure. That would be great, as long as we understand that epigenetic modifications are a result of genetics and environment, and it's not something of their own. Um, epigenetic modifications are not heritable, therefore they don't form a different uh, parameter. Uh, but uh, I would put epigenetic modifications as basically a molecular marker. Uh, in the same way that we measure gene expression, we measure proteomics, we can measure modifications of chromatin and the DNA in order to capture states sometimes capture potential, um, sometimes capture, you know, for example, methylation has been linked with socioeconomic status of people. So there's a lot of information in all kinds of molecular markets. And of course, epigenetic information is one of these molecular markets. Uh, if I may ask, there are a lot of questions, <laughs> as I see. I don't know if you have, uh, Professor Dermijakes, if you have time uh, to continue this I have discussion. An, another the five platform is ours. We can use it as much as, as, we, uh, mm -hmm. as we like. So. Uh, if you are, uh, please, uh, Vicky or Chrisa, go on with the rest of the questions. There are seven or more. Have a question have a about human. Okay, so uh, from Maria Cutini, uh, what is your opinion on selection of human embryos based on genomics, such as what uh, the company Orchid is proposing? Orchid. Yes, hmm. I know. This is. See, yeah. you see, this, <laughs> this is why this. Uh, yeah, I know. And actually, I have a friend who's who's very much involved in this, and we have been discussing about it. Uh, look, this is a very, a very controversial thing. I am against the idea of using polygenic risk scores for selection of embryos for lots of reasons. First of all, because we're not ready. We don't know enough to be selecting on anything. Um, the other problem is that even when we think we know, uh, selecting for one thing uh, can actually select, which seems favorable, can actually select negatively for something else. So, so, and that's actually what uh, parents would not know. The, the, the biology is so complex that when we're looking in the middle of, of, let's say, of the distributions, something that is positive in one aspect can be negative in another aspect for the same individual. And so we cannot be selecting for what perceived to be something positive when we don't know the full consequences of what we're selecting for. It's one thing to say, I want to select so that my child doesn't have cystic fibrosis, which is a devastating extreme phenotype that actually uh, affects the well-being in a massive way of the individual and, of course, the parents, and, or a Down syndrome patient. And, of course, that is even debatable, but that's very easy and understandable and it's very discreet. And it's a whole other thing to say, I don't want, I will select for a child that has reduced cardiovascular disease risk because this is uh, something good for that person. Because decreased cardiovascular disease risk could be something negative for something else. So overall, I think this leads to very controversial decisions. Uh, it can lead to, you know, choosing gender. It can lead to distorting frequencies of our variability. I think it poses a huge number of ethical, legal, and conceptual questions. Uh, so I'm, I'm, very, I'm very concerned about the concept of, of this company. Um, and uh, I mean, they, there's, um, the way they present themselves is that they're essentially pro-choice. Basically, the idea is that let's give people choice and they can decide whatever they want. It's up to them to decide whether choosing for one thing or another is right. 
But the problem is most people don't understand what they're choosing. So pro-choice of something you don't understand is not the right framework. People need to be well informed and actually making these choices. You need to sign this advice and uh, most scientists would never advise in favor of that. So it is highly problematic. So that brings us back to, uh, to my initial uh, question. The challenges involved with bringing genomics into everyday clinical practice is both um, research-like, but also bioethical and regulatory-like, which may be the reason why competent authorities around the world are posing more and more stringent requirements uh, for the regulation of uh, products coming out of genomic research. There's a difference, right? There's a difference in, in, in terms of having an intervention on the DNA of the next child that you're going to have, which actually can have an impact on frequencies and variability of the population eventually versus making a decision on the existing individual that has already been born and it, you're only dealing with that individual. And, and that's why the difference is, to me, genetics is just data for a living individual. It's not something that is, has a special ethical framework. I don't see differently. I mean, just to give you something very simple. If a Down syndrome patient walks in the street, I can recognize the genotype of that patient. They have an extra chromosome 21, mm -hmm. right? That's genetic mm -hmm. information, which I can recognize. Should that person cover their face so that I don't do that? I mean, you see, genetic information is everywhere. And so, Pretending that we should hide genetic information so that it's not usable uh, while we can use all the other stuff, right? It's completely, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of like, it's a hypocrisy in some way. Just to give you a very personal example uh, and to put it in the context of, of genetics. There's a very long discussion in genetics about this thing, the so-called thing, incidental findings. So I do sequencing of an individual to find something for a particular disease and i accidentally step on uh, brc1 and i find a major mutation uh, that actually predisposes that individual let's say it's a woman uh, to breast cancer okay i didn't look for that mutation i stumbled upon it should i tell them that i found this mutation the the guidelines generally in the past at least you say no because that individual never asked you about it Right, and there's going to be psychological, sociological consequences of knowing about this, blah, 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 blah. Great, okay? I understand that concept. Now let's go back to real clinic. My father-in-law, uh, when uh, about more than, more than a decade ago, uh, he had pneumonia and he did an echo. And as they were doing the echo to see the lungs, they went a bit low and found a major aneurysm in the central aorta. Should they have not told him that he has this binary? In my opinion, they should have told in both cases, also just exactly. exactly. This is the thing. But the thing, yeah. for genetic data, we say, no, don't tell them. But when we find the aneurysm, we should tell them. This is completely, it makes no sense. Either we tell in both cases, or we don't tell anybody. Oh, yeah. That's the problem. That's why I've been, that's one example why genetic data is being treated differently from other kind of clinical data when it should be treated in the same way. Thank you, Professor. May I have a question uh, about that? As uh, we uh, said about, uh, in, uh, this came out, uh, out, uh, out of our uh, symposium uh, and I found it very interesting. Uh, in uh, in the states, they have self certification somehow. Vicky knows uh, much of Dr. Valla uh, mm -hmm. than us than me. And uh, uh, in Europe, we have a quite different approach. Which uh, process, which approach you are in favor uh, with? I mean, uh, in uh, developing let me, uh, certain uh, 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 self certification, uh, if it is. Uh, a nice thing or not? When you say self-certification, what do you mean exactly? Uh, okay, so this probably has to do. 
yeah, this probably has to do with uh, uh, with in vitro diagnostics. Uh, but uh, the regulatory system coming out of uh, FDA is pretty different than the one uh, we have here in Europe, which is also uh, right now uh, changing with the new in vitro yeah. diagnostics regulation. Uh, the thing is that uh, FDA. Um, considers and the new European regulations consider that as well now for a, a very limited amount of products that some of them do not need do not require to go through the scrutiny scrutiny of competent authorities before they come into the market um, but uh, as you say professor Dermijakis, this has always uh, got to be examined on a case per case uh, scenario uh, this is not something that um, we could blame we could blame on genomics this is a more complex matter, and it is also associated to scientific validity, to the clinical performance of these products, and uh, uh, also their analytical uh, 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 analytical product. So I would say yeah, that I think we, need to be, we need to be a little bit more flexible about the way we perceive the data. Uh, I think that the we idea is that we are not. That's right. So, so I think that there's a difference between actually explicitly having a test for a particular position in the genome to say that it goes one direction or the other. And a difference, a different thing to say that the analysis of DNA shows collectively that I should be doing this treatment without necessarily having a particular point by point analysis of the whole genome. And I think that's where, that's where I say that the doctors have a lot of leeway and a lot of, of course, knowledge to accumulate in order to make these decisions. Genetic analysis give you the, the information, each individual having a different set of pieces of information that will then guide the decision. But you cannot actually say that, like for example, you can have a mutation in BRCA1 that is not a well known mutation. So what do you say in that? It, because no, no mutation, that has nothing to do with breast cancer risk. You need to somehow incorporate that. So then that's why the guidelines are not always useful. We need to actually break a bit the, the guideline driven way of doing medicine and, and be a little bit more reliant on real time knowledge that allows for real time decisions. That of course links with many things. Like for example, in the US, guidelines are protecting legally doctors from being sued. So we need to protect doctors legally before we can open these systems so that they can make these decisions more efficiently. So there's a whole network of, of dependencies for this to happen, but it needs to happen. Yeah, this is a very complicated issue and a lot of stakeholders are involved on a lot of different exactly. fields. Uh, yeah, and this is, a, this is a discussion that is going to stay with us for, mm -hmm. for the years to come, as you have very nicely uh, summarized in uh, your discussion. Uh, so we're going into 2030. Uh, Chrisa, unless we have any other questions from uh, Facebook and, uh, uh, and YouTube, I think it is time uh, uh, to thank uh, I think uh, I need yes. uh, just a quick comment of uh, Professor Dormizakis uh, on uh, something. So AI can reveal new patterns as enabling, as enabling constraints to interpret big data. These constraints can assist decision making, but if come to rigid AI deciding, they can easily bring system failure. So I would like uh, Professor Dormizakis, I would like you uh, just a quick comment on that so uh, we can finish. I mean, rigid, rigid frameworks are not, never are never good for. It. Basically, I'm, I'm, uh, that's what I was saying before. If you have a rigid framework, you cannot actually accommodate the flexibility that is required to make these decisions. Rigid requires that you have perfect information, and perfect information doesn't exist. So you need to be flexible, and that's why actually humans are useful in that respect to, to manage the, the 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 heterogeneity and the fluidity of the data. Uh, or the fluidity of the outcome that may be there from whatever computational process. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not in favor of very rigid structures and constraints. I think uh, this would uh, answer the Thank question. You. So, Vicky, you can move on. Thank you. Uh, Theo, unless you have uh, Yes, something... I have one question. Uh, actually, I would like, uh, uh, I recently read something about uh, your collaboration with uh, Bioiatric E. Uh, in, uh, uh, you can say some things about that if you wish. And uh, mm -hmm. this is something that uh, somehow 
uh, is alliance with, uh, I don't know if you have, uh, or you are uh, uh, from our audience, uh, seen in our symposium that uh, we wish to uh, get involved in what is called citizen science. So uh, you do something similar with the other key, and it would be nice to join forces and uh, discuss uh, uh, more sure. on that. But can you please tell us what is your uh, collaboration with Voyatriki? Yeah, so uh, basically Voyatriki has been considering for a couple of years now to bring polygenic risk scores into uh, basically a testing framework to, to assist doctors in terms of uh, uh, making decisions for prevention. Um, and uh, I was brought in as a scientific consultant to help them in bringing this forward to also help in communication issues to first first of all to the clinicians uh, in order to start adopting it and progressively also to the patients so that this becomes something that more and more people think about i think this is an important point communication is a significant part of it uh, also strategically how that moves along i think that uh, in my opinion there's a great opportunity for greece being kind of a virgin area in this without too many dependencies and animosities to mm -hmm. create something that could actually have a, a big impact on people's health. Um, and it's not an expensive way to do this. Uh, in integrated polygenic risk course is relatively cheap. Uh, and it can actually give you a bit of information, not for all diseases, for some, and for some more than others. Uh, but as, as more people volunteer to participate, the databases become stronger and the knowledge becomes more relevant. So clinical, uh, what, what people do not, cannot understand because it's difficult to capture is that the more people participate in these efforts, the higher the clinical utility becomes because they're being used also in the estimation of these effects. So that's why, a, 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 let's say, Greek-wide project would actually make everybody uh, everybody's data more useful to them. Of Jewish, let's say, somehow. Yeah. Look what happened uh, in uh, in Israel with uh, the vaccination. They had this uh, collaboration uh, uh, with, uh, and they 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 have involved. They get so many da data, and uh, uh, this at the end comes back to the to the society. This is what we have to inform the 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 the, the general public that if you uh, let's say participate somehow uh, in all these uh, efforts, uh, then we can uh, have a much better and more healthy, let's say, uh, society at the end. I don't know, Chris, uh, Vicky and Chris, if we have anything else uh, to discuss, if there are any other questions. I just want to close with some I made. Uh, I saw the video uh, uh, as we started, but uh, I'd like to say a few more words, what we can do in our platform, please. Yeah, are there any other questions? No, I think we have covered everything. Thank you for your patience, Professor. Okay, just a minute. Uh, I'd like to inform our uh, friends that uh, uh, participate in our uh, webinar today. Uh, the platform, uh, please uh, check and uh, uh, apply, register for us. You can network with other Greek and Cypriot uh, scientists uh, from all over the world. Uh, and uh, you can construct your personal uh, page. Uh, you can have, uh, you can uh, uh, video chat. You can uh, uh, participate in joint ventures. You can join groups. You partners for projects. You can find mentors or mentees. You can find a job. You can find service providers if you are a startup or a venture. Uh, uh, you can find uh, business and experts for copyright uh, patents, technology transfer, grants, uh, other business, financial and legal services. You can participate in events like this one. And of course, you can access learning and other material. Uh, the uh, video from this webinar is going to be available, uh, of course, as you can understand. And we plan some more things step by step. So uh, I'd you, like Leo. to... Thank you, uh, Professor Zdermijakis. The floor back to Vicky. Thank you so much uh, for uh, having this uh, uh, discussion and uh, hope to, have to, uh, uh, to see you soon in one of our next uh, webinars. I'll be glad to. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for, for the invitation. Perfect.
Professor Demidzekis, it has been a very stimulating discussion. We really want to thank you for your patience. And I think we have all enjoyed a discussion that was not uh, COVID related after uh, quite a few months. I think we have all enjoyed that. Um, I would like to thank everybody and just remind you that next week at uh, uh, six o'clock uh, European time, uh, Ludovic Vallet, professor at the University of Cambridge, will be discussing stem cell technologies to study the liver in health and disease. So feel free to join us. Uh, professor Dermizakis, it has been a great pleasure and honor. Thank you much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Seven o'clock Greek time, just to not confuse because yes. <laughs> we have confused Seven sometimes our Greek audience time. and feel sorry for that. Uh, okay, great. Thank you. Good, good ah, afternoon, everybody. The, the, you can, uh, after we uh, end this session, you can uh, network uh, on the platform. You are free to uh, meet with other uh, uh, scientists. Uh, we are going to be uh, uh, have the uh, uh, platform, the, the webinar open. So, we uh, finish. Vicky? Thank you. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.